so we had a YouTube comment uh, this week, um, which asked us a question, which uh, I think we should uh, kick off this week's show by uh, answering it. Um, so the comment was from Encapsulati- Encapsulatio, or <laughs> Encapsulatio. Uh, I'm not quite sure how to sp- how to say that. Um, and it's about Swift on Linux and Windows. Um, so we talked a little bit about Swift on Windows, uh, and I think probably a little bit about Swift on Linux in the last uh, episode. And um, this comment says, uh, does Swift work on Linux and Windows just as well as on Mac when it comes to a developer experience? What about developing apps that work on Android? Uh, can you uh, talk about uh, cross-platform development in Swift and also cross-platform compilation of Swift software? Um, so I think the answer to that is yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we can certainly try. <laughs> Well, we can certainly try. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So let's tr- let's try, shall we? Yeah, because can um, have we actually have have you have you made any attempts to run Swift on on Windows or Android? On Windows, no. On Android, no. Yeah. On Linux, kind of. Yeah. Yeah, I feel more comfortable about that side um, of the <laughs> of the fence. Yeah, and I think that's probably potentially where we should uh, where we should focus because, um, uh, and I, I do think that the question because there was a follow up post afterwards and it did talk about Linux specifically. So, um, so I think the question is mainly around Linux rather than Windows and, and Android. But but we should potentially touch on those too. Yeah. Well, the good news is if if we talk about uh, Linux, I guess a lot of it or will apply to Windows because as we probably get into it fairly quickly, the primary editor on Linux is going to be VS Code, which is a first-class citizen on Windows, right? Exactly, yeah. And in terms of developer experience, which is what this question is primarily about, um, I think that is that is really all we probably need to say, that um, as far as I know, VS Code works on Linux. It certainly works on Windows. It definitely works also on Mac. Um, so... There is a, um, a relatively official these days um, uh, extension for VS Code, which I think is under the uh, stewardship of the server work group, is it? Or is it is it completely independent? It is. I think it has moved into the um, official server's Swift um, account and is officially maintained, I believe. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah. And the maintainer is Adam Fowler. We should mention him because he's done a lot of work there to make that really nice. An enormous amount of work, yep. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, so that extension is available in the VS Code uh, extensions store, uh, if if it's called the store. But you know, whatever you install the extensions from, it's available there. And it comes along with a whole load of stuff by default. So uh, it hooks into the LSP, uh, which is the Language Server Protocol. Is it? Yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> we've done our homework. <laughs> As you can tell, this 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 podcast is excruciatingly researched. <laughs> uh, language server protocol, yeah. So um, that gives you things like uh, completion and highlighting and that kind of stuff. And then there's also some uh, extras in that uh, extension that uh, do, for example, when you open up a um, Swift package with VS Code, it does uh, uh, dependency resolution for you. Uh, there are also some commands in there that you can uh, build and, and uh, uh, test your package. Um, so I would say it's a pretty good experience. In fact, I would say it's actually getting on for a great experience to to develop Swift in uh, VS Code with that extension uh, installed. And of course, you can then do that on all those platforms, uh, Linux, Windows, and Mac. Yeah, and uh, just to extend that a bit, VS Code, I've, I've been using it a couple of times because while we do um, development mainly on, on the Mac for the server, uh, SPI server project, um, we deploy on Linux, so we sometimes have the need to actually run the or compile and, and test on on Linux because you know sometimes there might be small differences or you know things that we that we're debugging that might um, only happen on Linux. So there's a there, we have a certain need to actually run it on Linux ourselves as well, not just um, when we actually deploy the server. And it's 
that's when I use VS Code and, and even um, Nova recently, because that also has now a Swift um, extension with um, LSP support. So while it doesn't have the test runner stuff, it does have um, the uh, autocomplete and the, the pop-up stuff, you know, for, for the autocomplete. So that's quite nice. And VS Code brings in addition the little um, test runner UI, you know, like on the Mac, you have these little diamonds that you can click. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, th I believe that also works on Linux. I don't try that often because of the nature of things I, I tend to do when, when I get to that point, but I believe, um, that is now supported and, and should be working. So you can run tests that way individually or just all of them. Uh, that's quite nice. And I think it is worth saying that as far as I know, both of our experience with running this extension in VS code is running the extension in the Mac version of VS Code. And as you say, you can run those developer containers uh, to run the software that, you've, that you're working on in under Linux in, inside a container. But what, I, what certainly I haven't tried all of this in VS Code on different platforms, although I do believe it all works. Yeah, I, I imagine that might even be a good way to get started on Windows while support is probably not there like fully um there was just recently someone said they tried um using swift on windows and it didn't have a great experience and the, a better experience for now might be to run the same way we do on the mac you, you run vs code and then you uh, run a dev container with um the uh, swift image of a of a swift image in as a linux container on windows i i, I would imagine that works just the same as it does on the mac um, I haven't tried that. I don't know how good the experience that is uh, in Docker for Windows, but I would imagine that would work the same way. All of the component pieces are certainly available. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, that's that's certainly probably the easiest way to get started. And, and if you're worried about performance, that's actually an interesting thing I found out the other day because I ran our test suite on in a Linux container on the Mac. This is an, an uh, Apple Silicon Mac. And to my surprise, the tests actually run faster in the uh, in the container. So on in Xcode, they run in, I think, like 60 seconds. And in, in the container, it ran in, in 40 or 45 or something like that. It was a noticeable difference. I was going to say that's quite a significant difference yeah that's that's why i actually timed it because i noticed yeah it, it was really i i posted about it because i was so surprised that it was so much uh, faster i think it might be the terminal output so the console in xcode is is pretty slow i believe and i i wonder if that's the reason i haven't actually tried running it in terminal um on the mac to see if that, that makes a difference well maybe rather than upgrading my uh mac i should uh, switch to linux well <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I think, and and I was gonna. So I'm, I'm glad you brought up Nova because I know you've been using it recently, um, uh, and I'm glad to hear that at least some of that uh, is going across to other editors. Um, I don't know of any others apart from VS Code and Nova. I mean, almost certainly you can get this working in. Emacs because you can get anything working in Emacs, right? <laughs> um, uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I haven't heard of any other editors that have that have at least advertised. I know other editors do use the LSP, um, but uh, I haven't heard of any others kind of advertising support for Swift. So um, if you if you do know of any, then please drop us a comment uh, in either on the YouTube video or. Um, Actually, I don't think we have comments on the podcast, do we? So yeah, if you if you if you know of any, then drop us a comment on the YouTube video. Yeah, and I believe there there should be a fair number because LSP seems to be like the the common way to do this sort of thing these days, and yes, that should open up um, support for quite a number of editors. And and like I say, that there is that certainly that LSP is is in a, a lot of editors. So if but if it does more than that, because I think that's where code stands out, right? Yeah. So yes, thank you to Adam and everyone else who uh, who worked on the uh, VS Code plugin because I'm sure there are more yeah. uh, people. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it's something I use 
work because I use code to develop all the JavaScript and the CSS for the package index. And so when I'm doing that, in fact, I was doing it this afternoon, um, I also ran the server through uh, VS Code. And so that's the that's the situation in which I use uh, VS Code kind of in anger to, to do real work. When I'm working purely on Swift Code, I do still um, do it in Xcode. Uh, I find that experience is still um, noticeably better than than VS Code, but but it's certainly not it's certainly not something you're hobbling along with. You know, it's it's a it's a real it, it, it does work. <laughs> it, it does, and there are people, who, especially those who work just uh, exclusively on Linux, who who use it as a, an everyday tool and and do do say that they that that it's working great so i i think it's a, a viable approach to to use um, swift on linux i i don't think you're you're that um you you can have a great experience i believe yeah absolutely yeah um and then the final part of the question is android and i am gonna um uh basically say that i am <laughs> not very well up on uh making android apps in swift i i know there was uh a project and in fact i'm sure that project has continued i know there was a project that that, that got some way towards that but i i don't know the current status of that yeah me neither it popped up but it was quite a while ago that uh, there was some activity um, around android support and i i don't know where that went i don't think it's it's you know if in the in the hierarchy of next platforms i believe windows is probably the closest to seeing proper support and then uh, wasm is is the other one that comes to mind yes um i, I think that's the order in which we'll see new platforms um appear in in our compatibility matrix for sure sure yeah the only other thing to mention here is um it's not running swift on android but actually one uh, option for creating cross-platform at least back-end logic um, is Kotlin multi-platform so Kotlin is the language that you might develop any Android app in which I, I believe is is sitting on top of Java still but it's a different it's a very different language th than Java um, much more modern much much more like Swift actually um, and Kotlin multi-platform is a technology that allows you to share Kotlin code between Swift and uh, uh, your Android uh, applications, and um, and that I believe is really quite far along. You know, that's that's usable. Right? Is that is that like sort of like in spirit like the C plus plus support in Swift? Does it just mix um, objects and call from one language to the other, or how does that work? Really great question. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, we'll leave, leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> really really just a great question yeah <laughs> we we'll, we might have more of that in the future perhaps <laughs> i think um i think i think what we're what we're really uh acting as here is is uh, the the inspiration to uh to google and and go and search <laughs> and, and maybe there's someone listening to this and saying god damn it i, I know this <laughs> completely uninformed podcast hosts yes <laughs> Actually, no, not completely uninformed, only dangerously uninformed. <laughs> uh, um, speaking of, of um, questions, Dave, how do you add a package to the Swift Package Index? Uh, how do you add a package? You you go to the add a package page. That's that's totally out of the blue, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. How do you add? <laughs> I, wasn't a new... admit, I wasn't expecting that question, but yes, you go to the yeah, add a package exactly. page. Exactly. And... No one no one expects the Spanish inquisition. <laughs> Uh, is it a trick question? No, it is a very straightforward question, which you have actually answered recently, which is why I'm bringing it up. Yeah, you, you go to the uh, you go to the pack, add a package page on the package index site, and that, that takes you to a GitHub uh, issue that starts a workflow that that adds the package to the list. And I'm completely blanking on why I might why this might be relevant. <laughs> <laughs> so you went on a competing podcast the other day. Well, I listened to it. Uh, uh, you were on the More Than Just Code podcast with Tim Mitra. I was on the More Than Just Code. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You were, you were, and you've been asked this very question, and I was the one listening in, and 
almost shouting, Dave, no, it's easier. It's easier. It's easier than what that. What did I say? <laughs> well, you, you were kind of apologetic that it is, that is, uses Git and is a bit complicated. And you said there's a button to click and then you add the URL and stuff. And I thought this whole time, no, it's actually easier. It's actually easier than that. And, um, I wanted to just bring that up, not to, to shame you or anything, because it is, a, sure. that's, that's how we, uh, that, that's just the happy side effect, yeah. right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> 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 no, because I, I wanted to bring it up because I don't think many people know it and it's, it's sort of hidden, right? You, there is no UI for that really, but actually I find the easiest way. And that's how I add packages to the indexes. If you are on a GitHub page, you just replace GitHub in the URL with Swift package index, and then you land on a page which has a button. And then you just click buttons from there. You have no typing to do whatsoever because it, it pre-fills the pull requests that we then open with the URL already put in because you've just come from the site. So to, to explain what's happening there, if you replace the GitHub in the domain name with Swift package index, we go to a package page stub. We obviously don't have the package yet. Well, if we have it already, you're already done, right? You land on the page and you see, all right, there's nothing for me to do because the package is already there. If it isn't, instead of rendering a 404, what we do is we show a page which has a button where you can either go back to the GitHub page if you landed there in error, or you can click a, a button there that says add this package and then it opens up a pull request with everything filled in. And that's why I, I wanted to bring it up because I find that's actually the easiest way to do it because you, you don't, you can both check if it's already there and then add it in, in one step. There's no fiddling around to do. And, and that's, um, that, that's why I find it really easy. And if you want, you can even go further. And that's what I do. I have a little bookmarklet that does a replacement of the, and, and you wrote this, actually this bookmarklet. Okay. So it does a replacing of the GitHub in the domain name, you know, via JavaScript. So all I do is click buttons. I don't, I don't ever. Uh, to replacement typing. I'm not sure how we could better um, expose that or make that bookmarklet um, easy to install. I mean, I'm not sure if people add lots of packages that they might want to keep that bookmarklet around, but I do because I often add packages this way. But um, even so, I think it might be just easier to to just try a type Swift package index over the GitHub in the domain to get it all started. I don't know. So yeah, I'm I'm not sure how we could I'm not sure how we could make that process more visible. Um I, I deliberately don't mention that process. It is also the process I use to add packages to the index, and it is it is by far the easiest way, but that manual step of either knowing that you can do it with a bookmarklet or manually typing in Swift package index to replace GitHub um uh is is enough for me to not exactly keep it secret, but but not talk about it because it feels like a it feels like a a cheat code for adding packages to the package index. Um, <laughs> <All> right. <laughs> I think I think the 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 point that I was talking I don't remember exactly what I said just because I don't remember many things. <laughs> there are many <laughs> things I don't remember, but I don't remember exactly what I said with Tim. Um, but I think the point that that probably came up was that that process of the whole package list JSON file is it, it, like there are some problems with that file, and it makes it, it adds some friction to no matter what this process around getting something into that file is, it adds some friction to that process. But that it's important because that's the only record of who added what package to the index, and um, and and it's good just to have a little bit of a trail of like where did each package eventually kind of originate from. Uh, but it's, I mean, we've been kind of making it easier over the years, um, but actually the mechanism that we've used to make it easier, and, and I should credit James Sherlock here, who did a lot of the work yes. uh, to, uh, to initially get this working. Um, what we've actually done is we have made that process easier, but we've we've added various different ways to do the same process, and that in itself kind of makes things a little bit more complicated. Like we still get um, we still get 
pull requests that are people cloning the repository, editing the file, um, because that was the very original way of doing it. And there's probably some blog posts and stuff out there yeah. that say yeah. this is how you should add a package to the index. And so people follow people follow that. Um, and I do feel like we are we're kind of it's it's a it's a pain point of the package index that I I don't know. I, I don't know how we can easily fix it, but it's it, it has been on my mind a little bit late, uh, recently. So so there's probably a little bit of latent guilt when Tim <laughs> asked me a question that I wanted to confess <laughs> confess my uh, sins <laughs> maybe on the on the on the podcast. <laughs> I don't know. I don't the sins of adding a package. I I see the upsides probably more than the downsides here because even if the 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 list was in a different format and maybe not hosted in a GitHub repository, we'd still probably want to have some sort of audit trail who added it. And and that yes. sort of complexity doesn't go away. In fact, I think using GitHub here is, is making it easier because otherwise, it, would you want to ask people to create an account to add a package? That's, I, I feel like that's worse. So and I, I can't think of lots of ways to make that actually smoother than than it already is yeah so this is entirely why it is still this way um i i i and, and i think your your point is well made that you don't want to get people to add create an account to simply to add a package i think there is going to come a time um where there are several reasons you might want an account with package index um and and as that happens, if that happens, and it's definitely not a, it's definitely not a foregone conclusion that it will happen. Um, but that that might be the change, the the point that we need to change uh, how we do it. But 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 you're right that the the kind of audit trail, for want of a better word, is the reason. That's it. That's the only reason that it's like this. Yeah, and, and another upside is that the list is available, right? If anyone wants to use that list sure. for mm -hmm. anything, you know, like analysis or just, you know, have, have a list of all packages that are in the index, that's the place to go. And we don't have to deal with any requests around it. It's, it's all right there. So that's, um, that's certainly a, a strong reason to keep it open like this, which any other system would then have to replicate or, you know, offer in, in some way. That's great. Okay. Um, Shall we do some package recommendations? Let's do it. Yeah, I can kick us off. Uh, and my first package this week is from Jasmine Eilers, uh, and it's called NS Attributed String Builder. Um, and this is a package that's been around for um, only a few weeks. It's about a month old. Um, and it is a result builder type package. So it's... it's uh, uh, allows you to create NS attributed strings by putting, uh, defining kind of uh, methods on string uh, objects. Um, so you could say, for example, hello dot font, and then give it a font dot italic dot foreground color dot underline. Uh, it supports images, so you can say, um, give it a. Um, uh, there was an image example here. I was looking at it earlier. Oh yeah, here we go. There's a dot image uh, um, method that you can call on a string, which says, you know, here's a UI image or whatever it is, uh, and add that into the attributed string. You can put new lines in there. You can add other attributed strings if you've already got attributed strings. Um, and of course, out of the result of this comes a newly formed attributed string that you can use all over the place. Um, and I mean, there are lots of ways to generate attributed strings these days foundation has markdown parsing these days and certainly has some level still of html parsing um but if you just want to generate some attributed strings to pop in your project um that that default syntax for it um uh, I rem i've i've written many many lines of uh, attributed string code in my time and uh, this certainly seems like uh, um, a significantly easier way to put together a, a kind of native attributed string Nice. That sounds really nice. I haven't actually used an attributed string that much, but I, I have seen examples. So you have to do lots of sort of range stuff, right? Where you, when you have um, uh, bold and italic and that sort of stuff, don't you? You have to fiddle a bit like... Um, yes. 
lots of ranges. Um, I have also just noticed uh, at the bottom of the readme file, which I didn't see when I was looking at it originally, uh, it says this project is inspired by uh, Ethan Huang's project, NS Attributed String Builder, which has the same, uh, and uh, SVDO slash uh, Swift hyphen rich string so there are a couple of projects here um and actually we were chatting just before we recorded the podcast and one of the things that i said was <laughs> i have a i have a feeling that we've talked about this before and we hadn't but it's possible we talked about one of these other ones before we, we might have because the i've seen a couple of packages like this and it's a it's a, i think it's a great example where uh, a builder can help construct these things because they are sort of fiddly to yeah. to get right and that's i think that's where these kind of builders help um, lay out things in in a better way than by sort of low level fiddling with properties and stuff and we do have both of those packages in the index so that is um rich string by stefan van der oud uh, and uh a package with exactly the same name, NS Attributed String Builder uh, by Ethan Huang. My first pick is a pick you have probably seen. You might even have it in the list, but I'm going first dibs. <laughs> the package is called <laughs> POW, P-O-W by uh, Rob Bönke. Um, you probably know this package, right? I am aware of this package and I did see the news about this package, yeah. So the news this week, this is actually a now open source version of the package that was previously a, a licensed package that you would buy. And what it does, it the tagline is delightful Swift UI effects for your app. Um, and if you've followed Rob on, on Mastodon um, or perhaps elsewhere, that's where I've seen it. Um, he's been posting amazing examples of what this library can do, like animations, transitions, that sort of stuff, like, like really delightful ways of enhancing your um, UI and a particular Swift UI here with sorts of all sorts of modifiers and things that, that make it really interesting and fun. Um, so that's what this package is about, um, enhancing your Swift UI. There's a great site with examples of all the effects that are available. I did try to run it in a playground. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in with our trying to playground um, mechanism. I believe that's, I mean, it runs, but it doesn't show anything. I think that's because um, it uses, it, it needs to run on device or at least on a proper simulator, not just on the, um, in the playground. Um, it seems like this is running on a layer that's not present in, in, in Swift playgrounds. That's my speculation. Um, but the example page should help give you a preview of all the things that are available and it's extensive. There's lots of stuff you can do and it's, it's just a great package and uh, people seem to be really excited that it's now available. And by the sound of it, your cats are also big fans of this package. <laughs> she absolutely is. <laughs> <laughs> and and I say that to, to to save me the pain of trying to edit those out. <laughs> well, it's uh, this is this is going to be this is going to be the case for a bit because um, apparently I've been um, the service has been lacking around here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think so. So I, I did see that this that this went um, uh, to be uh, a kind of freely available uh, uh, open source project uh, this week, and I mean, the work that Rob does in many different aspects of of, uh, uh, of Apple platform development is is remarkable. But this is another great example of of the work that he does, and and um, I think it's also worth mentioning that. The, the reason that it went um the, the the transitioned to free and open source this week was um that it's effectively being sponsored by um, emerge tools who were previous sponsors of the swift package index um and i took a quick look into um uh, into the the kind of n not the not the the details of it of course but um uh, it looks like Emerge Tools are actually sponsoring quite a f number of Swift packages in, um, uh, in in the kind of package ecosystem. So that is definitely to be uh, encouraged. And um, uh, and we had a great experience working with them on the Swift package index too. So uh, it's great to see this happen. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy that more people will get to use this this package. That's fantastic. I was about to ask if you if you know any because I didn't know of the details why or how that came about. I only saw that it ended. It's hosted in the Emerge Tools um, GitHub account now, but that's great. That's great news. Yeah. So I think you know the open source needs 
uh, more funding and uh, and yeah. this is a way for that to happen and and there's obviously a, a kind of uh, logo in the in the header of the the um, the readme file there and various links and stuff and if if that's what it takes to make uh, open source um, uh, development uh, you know a, a more uh, practical and comfortable thing to do then then that's great yeah my next package uh, is by Mikhail Vosbinikov and it's called Gestures. Um, and it's been around for about a year now. Um, and this is a enhanced gesture API for SwiftUI. So obviously SwiftUI supports all of the standard um, kind of gesture recognizer type uh, gestures that you would have used in UIKit or uh, well, UI kit basically. Um, and, um, but there's still quite a lot of work you need to do with kind of interpreting the gestures and seeing, you know, what trigger point, like if you have a swipe gesture, you'll obviously get the coordinates of where you're swiping to and the distance and stuff like that. But, but it's your decision on what to do. And actually in reality, there are a bunch of really common things that you might want to do. So for example, um, you might want to add a swipe gesture that only actually triggers something when you've moved more than at least 15 points uh, within the kind of context of that swipe. Um, and this is what that package does. So uh, it, it adds a whole um, set of uh, um, extensions to Swift UI gesture API um, that help you locate gestures and do things like trigger on minimum distance and that kind of stuff. Um, uh, so yeah, it gives you coordinate information, gives you location information, uh, and very easy to integrate in, in your projects. And as, as it says in the readme file, it's a lightweight uh, package. So I don't think this is a, a, a huge amount of code that you're adding to your project. Nice. Right. My second pick is called Scintilla Lib and it's by Danielle. That's, that's all I have as far as author information goes. Um, and this is, I'm taking a page from Dave's uh, book of package picks here, because that's a dependency you, a package you probably won't need or won't use as a dependency, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's a fun project to poke around in and, and run the examples of. Uh, what it is, it's a ray tracer ported from Clojure to Swift. Um, and what it does, uh, it's, it's intended to be used more like a library rather than uh, like an app or, or anything, but you can run it as an app and it has a little uh -huh. um, render view and UI where you can actually just render the thing and get some output. And it ships sort of like a Swift UI type DSL where you can describe the scene, you know, like your objects, your camera, and then you can uh, run it and, and you get a, a screen that shows the rendered output. And uh, I found that really nice. Um, it, it gives you something to play with and uh, give you, a, you know, a, a little playground to try ray tracing if, if you're new to this or, you know, if you, if you want to play around with that. A really fun little project that I ran. Also something that doesn't run in a playground, but it is very easy to just stick the examples in a um, command line app. So there's a description in the readme how to set this up. You effectively just create a blank um, Xcode project, command line project, and then paste in the main um, thing, you know, the at main decorated um, um, result builder thing. And it is, is pretty a bit like an app that you create in Swift UI that you then create in this DSL and you run it and you get this window and it shows the rendered output. Really nice, um, nice little thing to play around with um, with ray tracing. I have so many questions. Um, <laughs> does it does it use uh, does it do its own ray tracing or is it, is it using metal or? That's a great question. <laughs> 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 Revenge. <laughs> it uh, it opens a window. There's a there's a you know it it draws it line by line. So there's something happening. Um, there's not a whole lot of cores firing when that happens. I I don't know under the hood if it's accelerated. I I suspect it isn't. Right. It. I think it would be faster if it was. Um, this this seems to be a port from Closure. So I I don't. I'm to be honest, I don't know how, how that would work if on either end, if that was accelerated, but I would imagine if it's, it, 
if it's ported from another language, it sounds more like it's a, a like pure software um, ray tracer that is then ported one to one. But that's just me speculating without knowing a whole lot about um, ray tracing and and the mechanics of all that and, and metal sure. uh, for that matter. Sure. Well, I, certainly, I, I I didn't actually spot that one going through, so I I'm gonna ha- go and have a have a look at that after after the show. My final package this week is kind of along the same lines. Um, it is uh, called Model 3D View uh, by um, Freak, F-R-E-E-K. And what I really liked about... So the, the package description is render 3D models with SwiftUI effortlessly. Um, and what I kind of liked about this is that it describes itself as uh, image view for 3D models, which is... Um, an interesting way to think about it because we use image views all the time just to you know pop an image on the screen and we don't really need to think about any of the stuff that needs to happen to get that image on the screen um and this model 3d view uh package uh basically does the same for uh, 3d models now i know that swift ui has uh native support for usdz um models uh through the quick look framework i think um but this also supports uh something called gltf uh models which is uh graphics library transmission format uh which i believe is something came up that came out of webgl uh and again i i would ask you please no detailed questions about this because uh because my knowledge of this is a wikipedia article <laughs> uh we are we are making the least researched podcast in his, the history of podcasting here um but yes it uh supports gltf files um and you can pop a skybox in there so you can have a kind of a 3d uh, background or a 2d background inside a skybox um you can change lighting you've got some interactive camera controls uh and The best bit about it, as far as I'm concerned, is you can pop a Model 3D view into your SwiftUI view, and the only parameter you need is is to pass the um, the, the, the model file name in, and and there you go. You can then, if you want to, you can transform it, you can rotate it, you can scale it, you can transform it, um, you can give it a new camera you know there's there's lots of different things including interactive cameras and as i say like things like sky boxes and stuff like that um but i liked the description of this as like well this is image view for 3d um 3d objects and and that i think is a really nice uh utility to have inside inside apps these days um in the uh in the frequently asked questions um there's a question here. Can I use this to make a 3D game? Uh, and the answer is in bold, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so it's it's not, this is not a 3D framework. This is just, as I say, image view for 3D. Nice. Did, did you mention the, you, I think you mentioned a couple of formats, like 3D, mom, but model 3D wasn't wasn't a format. It's it's a placeholder for any any sort of supported 3D format, right? Yes, um, I'm not sure of the full list of formats it supports, but I know it supports this GLTF because it calls that out specifically. Right. Um, so, but yeah, Model 3D View is the name of the the view that you would insert into your SwiftUI right. uh, view hierarchy. Nice. Yeah, it's interesting with these that has largely gone away, uh, gone away, right? With the um, um, graphics format, display format. I remember back in the day, one of the most used programs on my mac was graphics converter uh-huh yes yeah. to convert between all the different formats that you would find on the internet and you couldn't actually display unless you use that tool or you know converted it with that tool to a format that the mac could display out of the box so we've we've come a long way where anything is really uh, supported isn't it with 2d yeah. graphics at least in, in without even you don't even have to think about it anymore you just kind of say so images are yeah. as easy to work with as text um whereas i remember in my very early days writing uh object pascal to decode uh windows bitmap files and having to read byte by byte and mm. <laughs> yeah it was a very long time ago it's it's interesting in with live text it's, it goes even further that they're not that they're sort of sometimes even equivalent to text right i've had cases where i 
had something and I took a picture and then copied the text out in like a, a router password that I didn't want to type, where it's become almost synonymous in, in some regards. There's a little bit of friction still in taking a picture and, and using it as text, but it's it's surprisingly little friction these days. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah I use that all the time too. Right, my third pick is called Swift UI Core Image by Dan Wood. And this is a really interesting package. So what it does, as the name uh, pretty much says already, it integrates core image into Swift UI and gives you a sort of modifier based way of applying or creating image pipelines and pre preview them like for instance in a playground so this is something that you can actually use with our try in a playground feature and it's it's really nice to take an image and then create these pipelines you know like apply a sepia filter or a gaussian blur or something like that so you know mm -hmm. all the things that you yep. know from core image and I, I'm not using, I've not used that a lot, but I, I core image is, is a different beast, right? It's, it's, is a completely different API. So having that available and being able to use that on like regular, regular Swift UI images is really nice. And it has dozens and dozens of modifiers. So it, it looks like it's a really extensive, um, coverage of the core image API. Uh, it's a, has some nice examples as well and is an all around great package if you have that sort of need to create a core image pipeline and play around with transforming images really and there's a whole load of stuff that core image can do that you that you would probably be surprised that uh it's it's a it's an api which has been around for a long time but it's a very powerful api yeah so yeah there you go swift ui core image by dan wood and so I think that brings us to the end of today's uh, episode. And actually, this will be, as I mentioned at the end of last week's uh, episode, uh, or the last episode that we published, um, this will be the last um, podcast that we record in 2023. Um, so um, I want to wish everybody happy holidays and uh, thank you for listening this year. It's been uh, it's been something that I've really enjoyed uh doing again this year and uh and i'm i'm happy to see that it's gaining some traction and, and people mention it more and more uh and so really happy to to kind of see it uh it find its feet a little bit uh because when we started this we didn't really know what it would become we started this actually as twitter spaces and it was a very a very low um uh very low effort uh affair at the beginning you know we just jumped on uh no 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 attention paid to audio quality or or indeed uh the quality of the the content that we talked about which has remained you know as we, as you've heard today um but we didn't really know where it would go and and as we come to the end of uh 2023 i think it's worth just um just uh, just kind of saying thank you so much for listening uh please do if you enjoy it please do uh share the podcast with uh other people and um we'll be back next year yeah, thanks for listening. Do let us know if you have questions, comments. Always love to hear what people think or if they have questions, ask us and we'll address it. And uh, yeah, happy holidays and see you next year. See you next year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.